not so typo negative. It's been doing that. A few, it's done that a few times to me, actually. Um, I, two other times before when I've done this, it's given me that with this new camera. Okay. But uh, it seems okay now. Yeah. You're built in God. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something okay. surging through. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, something that I noticed that I did not do the first time I did one of these is that because I was streaming with a friend of mine, I was like, I already know everything about, you. well, I already know a good amount about your practice. Obviously everyone else does too. So I'm not even going to ask, but right. I'm not going to make that assumption at this moment. So I just want to start by asking, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Do you want to give us a summary of what you do, what your hidden rates like, what you base it on? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Johan Aofor. Um, mostly what I started my practice in all of this doing is blacksmithing. Um, that's now moved on into a fitness routine and clothing line that I'm slowly building with a few friends of mine um, while still trying to maintain the blacksmithing aspect of things. Um, that's mostly how I make my money lately. I've been doing a lot of writing and me and two other colleagues of mine have been working on a new website that we're going to be launching within the month, hopefully, which will focus around mythopoetic um, Germanic traditions and folklore. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So that's the uh, basis for a lot of your personal practice is more the Germanic pantheon? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a, a great deal of Celtic as well, as you would imagine with the name Johan. I'm uh, of a Welsh background as well as an English Germanic background. And so um, that's always crept into a lot of the artistic side of things. So outside of my money, what I would say my hobbies are and always have been are um, predominantly music and uh, with with a side order of a little bit of um, painting and drawing, which you can see in, in some of the uh, music projects I do. I try and keep most of the art to myself or, again, uh, employing friends. Okay. Well, so you also have your band uh, Unbow, right? Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. And our original name for Unbowed was our own, actually. So I think I, we might have mentioned that before, or I, I might have left that a secret until right now. But yeah, that was our founding name. Yeah, there was actually a tree in the forest that me and the other founder, Alex, um, that we, we actually used to um, go to towards uh, some sort of ritual that we began just as, as kids. And from like 13 to 16, we would visit this tree. And so it was named the Our Own Tree. And that's how we got our name Our Own from that sort of thing. <laughs> so okay. it's all based from, yeah. It's strange how this stuff always finds its way back into my life. But um, I guess that's one of the many reasons why I'm here to talk about it with you today, because it's okay. actually still important. So, yeah. I mean, when did you uh, start discovering that uh, pull towards that side of things in your life because you mentioned when you were a kid so it sounds like you started early that's right well my mom was always very into the occult stuff so uh growing up in wales she was um big into tarot cards and astrology and all that and so i've always been um primed for that sort of aesthetic um I'm, like there's a there's a festival in england called uh jubilee day which is very similar to Canada Day, or um, I'm not sure what it would be in US, actually. Do you know what it would, like, 4th of July, I guess? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, so typically that's the day where you dress up in, like, red, white, and blue in the Union Jack colors. And I remember saying, I remember looking at my mom, and I was like, I want to go dressed as the Grim Reaper. And she was like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and just being typically Welsh, she was, like, totally okay with that and wanted to go with me, go with me and just, like, watch all the faces of people. Just, uh, I'm almost polarizing and edgy to the point where it's like, you know, you're self-aware of how edgy you're being. I've just always been like that, apparently. And no. I don't, I don't seem to be stopping. <laughs> and <laughs> so okay. I'd say those, yeah, those would be the childhood roots of it, but more into um, young adolescence. And um, I mean, more into young adulthood, I guess it would be just traveling around um, the countryside of England. So I've lived in Canada since 2002, but I go back to England nearly every year, as, aside from this year for obvious reasons. But uh, just traveling those paths, uh, being, being very inquisitive with our background, history, culture, and myth and all of that, and the ambiguity of all of it and how it's, uh, you know, you've got some Latin in there, you've got some French, you also have the Germanic side, the Celtic side. It's all just an amalgam, and it, it reminds me a lot of the human brain, where you're not completely sure on one pathway, and so you're always looking for different ways. And just since I was a young metalhead, I guess, being inquisitive into different black metal bands, reading lyrics, reading liner notes, all of that sort of thing, it's just always been a culmination of many different um, aspects of my life that have 
led me onto that path, I suppose. But uh, a lot of different points of connection, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think more um, tangibly, what I could say at the moment of uh, absolute focus would be was uh, climbing up an old um, Roman hill fort. There's a, quite a lot of those in the North Welsh uh, region of England. Mm -hmm. And so climbing up that, seeing the history, and then actually just feeling something rather different on the wind, as hippie as that sounds, that was kind of the main, uh, you know, changing point. That's where I could say my life began and no longer feels like a distant memory, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's and that would, be, that would be around 2010, so when we started uh, Unbowed, actually. Okay, so that's that's been quite some time, and I guess yeah. that's another thing too is, um, do you are you driven uh, in your practice more by what you sense and intuit in that way, or are you following um, maybe more of a connection to heritage? Is it both? If that makes sense, it makes absolute sense. Yeah. So again, starting from um, just my inquisitive personality into things like. Um, history and folklore and myth and just reading a lot when I was in my young adulthood in high school. Um, that kind of gave me the building blocks, but um, over a short amount of time, I think eventually, like me and my friends eventually realized we wanted to go about it our own way. And there's not so much a reason in looking to gospels if we were so anti-Christian as we were growing up. We didn't really feel the need to uh, look for rules per se. And I know lots of people hate it when you call them rules, of course, but, um, I think the, the best way to describe it would be, uh, the closest thing I have to a, a, a religion or religious text would be Havamal, um, or more historically, maybe Tacitus Germania. So, you know, there's little hints or fragments of what we could say, uh, is going on in history, but ultimately I think we're making a new history is what me and uh, my tribe try to do. That's a really great way to put it. That's something where um, I've uh, gotten into not arguments, but like heated discussions with some of my friends who um, are more yeah, always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I try yeah. To do it lovingly. Um, yeah. But that's my thing with sort of like reconstructionist pagans is like, I am a druid because I value the scholarship. But at the same time, uh, we are in the here and now, right? And like, we need to create something sustainable, you know, because I'm not, I mean, and that's sort of the other point of being pagan is that we're not here to follow a script per se. And that's also not going to give us the spirit of why the ancients were doing what they were doing. We can try and follow it, you know, as much as we can, but that's also the thing with Celtic um, paganism or heathenry or what you want to call it is we really don't have as much concrete writing um, as say maybe exactly. even the Norse pantheon does. Just because, exactly. I mean, people, I mean, the, the general narrative is that the Celts didn't leave a, uh, you know, like a written record. I personally have a conspiracy theory that they did and the Romans destroyed it. That's just my personal thing. I could be completely <laughs> yep. wrong. And I also just have a grudge. Um, <laughs> But against guess, the Christian Romans, yeah. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, I'm okay. Mad forever, while also right. admiring, but still mad. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I guess that's uh, that's more what I want to talk about tonight, and part of why I wanted to talk about it with you is, um, uh, with all the love in the world to the Norse and Germanic pantheon, I feel like that's really getting its moment right now, and there's not a lot, there's not as many, um, you know, just Celtic inspired pagans with a real grasp on the myth. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, and ask you, like, what does this season, what we call Samhain season or the dark times, what does that mean for you? What gods might you connect with that? Um, I guess and start there. Yeah, well, for me, um, the Celtic gods have always meant uh, my connection to Wales. And so in a word mostly Cernanos, so the horned god is where I would draw my connection to, and it's kind of where I began to realize I'm not predominantly um, tethered to a Germanic myth or deity group, if that makes sense. Sure. So, um, again, what we were also talking about here being uh, the wild hunt, I think that also plays a big role into where I would see myself crossing over the threshold there of saying I'm strictly a Saxon pagan or of some sort. Uh, 
I think there's a lot more to it than that. And even if I don't want to um, cross into somewhere where I, I don't know as much about, which would be the Celtic myth compared to my um, view on Germanic myths, I would say that a lot of their gods are extremely similar to ours, and that is due to our connection through the Indo-European theories and the haplogroups. And so where our DNA connects and how our myths connect and even to as far as the Vedic traditions. So even, um, I guess, what would you, what you call Hinduism today? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, connections there linguistically as well as mythically. And I think that's where I would be best to talk about the Celtic myths with you, I think. So if that makes sense. Yeah, that yeah. absolutely works. And I mean, for one, I, I feel like um, this sort of Germanic, Saxon, you know, what have you, that kind of mythology is really kissing cousins with a lot of the Celtic mythos. I mean, even down to the values that are sort of implied or mm -hmm. recorded within the myths. Um, especially when you think of something like hospitality and honor and reciprocity like that those are sort of like the to me that's what i've seen as the sort of absolutely things. um even if they're illustrated a little differently like a lot of it if it's not outright interchangeable it's very complementary so those go together in my mind yeah absolutely and going back to your first point the the essence of um uh, you know just being a good human that's yeah. that's going to be present in most of our myths and is even adopted by uh, Western Christian Christianity in many ways. There's a lot of things that would connect that, um, you know, proof of that being our our ancestors in the North wouldn't have really taken too well to uh, Christianity if it weren't for things like the Yelling Stone. If you're familiar with that, that's a, a motif of Christ on the cross, but he's um, writhing in roots instead. So there's a natural element there. It, that, it, to me, it's always seemed more Celtic as well in its look. So uh, like the Celtic knot sort of art style. Right. It, it's very similar to that sort of thing. And so to, you know, deny these sort of connections would be ludicrous in itself. But yeah, talk, talking about um, just being a good person again, I think that goes back to recreating your own sort of traditions. So, you know, me and my friends will meet in the woods like weekly, basically, to have a fire and just talk about life and everything like that. And that's not written anywhere per se. And it might be more uh, in a riddle form, but, you know, Essentially, what it is, is, you know, creating connections, creating, uh, you know, rituals in that way, I think. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I think that's uh, keeping the spirit of the thing. Um, as yeah, just the, uh, the script. So I guess, um, in that vein, people sort of the, I guess, textbook or conventional definition of Samhain in the season is that it's all about um, the ancestors and the dead, which it very much is. But the thing within the uh, sort of Celtic view is that um, it's not so much just the ancestors as it is all spirits, right? So you have the she and the deity, mm -hmm. I mean, you have all of it. Yeah. And one of the uh, themes, and this is another thing that crosses in with uh, sort of Norse paganism, is you have the idea of the wild hunt, which is just like tearing through the world during the dark times. I think of them as sort mm -hmm. of a culling force like it's almost something that like enforces i hate the word virtue <laughs> but like oh no yeah absolutely i know what you mean the better one. yeah yeah, yeah. Chris, what you're um, about that are and what how you would talk about the wild hunt for sure yes uh, well how i would talk about the wild hunt uh varies in a few different ways so if we're keeping to the celtic myth or the type of celtic myth i know uh, you could look at Arun, which is part of the, the first branch of the Mabinogion, and he's kind of alluded to in the fourth branch. And for anyone who doesn't know what the Mabinogion is, it's about, um, I'm pretty sure it's like 11 different tales split up into four branches. Yeah. And so the first branch, um, the Cernanosian uh, sort of role or the, the psychopomp role there of the, um, the, the passer between one world or the next would be Arun, but that slowly turns into... Gwynapnith, which is um, kind of, yeah, he's later on, but the name Gwyn in itself talks about that sort of tearing into a horrible new threshold sort of thing that you were alluding to there. Uh, Gwyn could mean white, which uh, in itself is a kenning or riddle towards, you know, winter, essentially. So the cold times, and this is really the time we're talking about here today is the thinning of the veil. It's the time where everything is thinnest. And so, you know, you're going to feel those psychopomps. You're going to feel this sort of energy where 
uh, coincidences are happening. You know, I, I think maybe anyone in the world right now can tell you, like, around this time, they feel a lot more coincidences. And whatever that means, obviously, we're essentially dogs we're seeing in black and white. I think there's more colors than what we're able to see, if that makes sense, you know? Sure. And that's, uh, that's something that I like about <clears throat> one of the uh, more Celtic leaning, not leaning, uh, one of the Celtic pagan authors that I really enjoy, Morgan Domler. <clears throat> she oh yeah of, oh yeah mm -hmm. she, uh, I, I love that she uses uh the analogy uh not so much of the veil thinning which is definitely like a valid one but she talks more about um it's almost more like there are realms that are usually not so much interacting with each other but during Samhain and during these sort of like uh more liminal periods the boundaries between them become a lot more enmeshed and it's almost like they're interacting with each other in a different way than they normally are where they they're sort of more dif distant usually exactly yeah it's kind of like a well if i were to keep with it yeah like a tapestry compared to a veil which you can see through you can understand and interact with but maybe not understand who's making those shapes sort of thing that that's where i would bring that into it right uh, but, yeah but if you go back further in time before we can even say what they would have named that sort of thing, you can look at myths in England, kind of like Wistman's Woods. And that's something that uh, Survive the Jive touched on a couple of times, if you've ever watched his videos. But uh, Wistman, that that would really mean Elfman's Woods. And uh, that almost gets uh, Tolkien immediately, because if, if you want to talk about the psychopomps and, you know, Wistman Woods is probably one of the most uh, notorious places for seeing the wild hunt in England. Okay. Um, yeah, the elf man's woods, that would make perfect sense. Uh, you know, Gandalf meaning Cain elf and essentially alluding to Odin, who has many names. Right. And, you know, this this figure of the wild hunt has, has been seen as many different people throughout the British Isles and even further into into history, you know, like Johnny Cash sings about, uh, you know, right. the same sort of motif. Right. But, you know, you can see Aron, you can see Odin, Woden, uh, Hearn, various different people like that. Um, Sometimes even Arthur, King Arthur, has been known to be seen in the sky. Um, there's one area in Wales I was looking at earlier, actually, just doing a brush up that where he's. It's very uh, typical to see the the Cunanun, which is the the hounds of our own, right. and that's in a, a place called um, Idris's throne. Essentially, is what it translates to, and it's a mountain range within the North Welsh um, park known as Snowdonia. Okay. And, a lot of the time that would mean for farmers or wayfarers trying to get home during the night if they heard uh, the hounds of Arun, it would typically be very blaring for about 10 minutes or so. And as they get closer to you, uh, their sound becomes less known. And so I think that really goes back into that sort of, we can maybe understand some things, but some things are not there, you, you know? Sure. Yeah. So also for um, anyone who's watching this, who's maybe not as familiar, uh, I definitely want to touch up on, you know, who and what Arun actually is. Um, so as you said, he is a psychopomp and he's generally thought of as the Lord of the other world, which some people say is Lord of the dead, but I think there is a subtle, there's an important difference between those two. Um, and I, I see it said a lot that he's like the, he, he also pertains to terror, revenge and warfare. And I'm, I feel a little yes and no about that because to me, Arun is very much about honor and sort of upholding uh, your word. And mm -hmm. there's, I feel like just terror by itself has almost this arbitrary quality to it that I feel almost like mildly offended on his behalf because he's not chaotic in that way, at least in my mind. So I think, yeah, yeah. I think, I think terror is a funny word to use and it's typically a, a word used in 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 this sense with death and what most humans fear most uh, would be death and there's a reason why we fear death and it's typically because we haven't done enough with our lives so the the few of us that do things with our lives and really try and understand that death is close um, and for me 100 percent the reason my main gods would be the death gods is because I want to remain tethered to death I want to understand that I might die tomorrow, tonight, what have you, and to live now. And so being a psychopomp god, I think, is to be a mirror of what's inside you, what's left living, what's dead, and to really try and ignite whatever is there there within, you know? Okay. So 
I think that uh, idea of people saying the death god in a spooky way, and there's well, plenty of people, as soon as you like Google how to worship Odin online, you'll get people being like, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that if I were you, and like, you know, all sorts of stuff. But it's, yeah. it, you're only going to fear death if you don't feel like you've lived, I think. And so what you're really fearing is to live. I think that's pretty apt. And I feel like that's, uh, in my super UPG experiential intuition on it, um, I'm sure people could argue about whatever they want. I feel like that's also <laughs> part of the point of the wild hunt is yeah. it's not just to arbitrarily fuck with you for no reason. And no. if you're in alignment, you know, like if you can stand upright and you have your own ethics and what, what have you, I don't see them just coming for you for nothing. Like that's not the point. I no, think. absolutely not. I, I completely agree with you there. Um, you know, I think a lot of me and my friends spent most of our adolescence wishing we'd see something like that. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the exact same point that I just made, which is there's those who wish to live in interesting times and those who really don't uh, want to be uh, rocked in their boat on their way to death, <laughs> you know? Sure. So, you know, being, sh being uh, shown a blatant image of death or something like that, uh, being so upset with meeting something like Merlin, which, you know, if you translate the roots of Merlin to its French roots, it would be, uh, let me see here, Merlet, which would be Blackbird, which again, just goes back to the, you know, the death birds. That's, it's an omen usually, but what is an omen really to, to anyone but the peasantry? I think it would be a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign, yeah. It's a sign of something shaking up. Someone's asking who wouldn't want to be taken by the hunt and join them. Probably people with something to hide. That would be yeah. my thought, honestly. Yeah, fantastic comment by Weird Walker there. Absolutely. <laughs> that's the, uh, if you're late to the, the point there, that's a, that's exactly what we were just saying. Um, people who fear the death god are the people who haven't lived yet, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's also, I think, where comments like or adjectives like terror uh mm -hmm. red like it's this perception that is really only true if you're coming from that uh kind of background um and i think that's why certain gods in addition to certain like realms like the uh the other world relating to them is not so much just going to a physical spot or saying the right words or whatever you are actually it has more to do with the quality of your spirit or the quality of your being like where you actually are mentally energetically not so much in a yeah. way but you know um, absolutely so what would if you um were to say that there were certain kinds of magic that would be more potent or more appealing for this time of year is that an idea that you relate to or yeah um in you know awesome and in it, in it, all it's uh sort of I guess the best word for it would be majesty is, you know, that thinning of the veil sort of feeling. So it really brings to mind stuff like, um, like uh, the hermetic sort of um, astrological and alchemical thoughts, if that makes sense. So that sort of that mystery and magic um, really is what is prominent in my mind in this time period. Uh, so typically the type of thought process I have around now is, you know, very Jungian, if that makes sense. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how well you're. Yeah, yeah we've had a, we've had a few <laughs> talks about Carl Jung, right? So, you like you know, that. like that one quote of his is, um, "No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach right. down to hell." Yeah. That sort of alchemical magic is what's most prominent prominent in my life and my what I'd say my tribe's um, mentality around this time of year, and so yeah. you know, really li living through that sort of hope for seeing um a personification of that in the sky would be great obviously but if you can't see that then at least let the the rager rage inside and so odin if you break down vodanage is the rage or the frenzy and so that makes sense to me as well and another form of that rage would just be exactly that let your roots reach down to hell so you can reach heaven uh that's dipping from one world to the next that's being a great tree in both worlds um how you would do that is through a, a philosophy of a, a Apollo and Dionysus. And again, that's just movement. And so what you could see that as is a, a tethering to the rune Naldis, which is, if unfamiliar, it's the straight rune like that. And then it's going down across like that. 
right. essentially what it's symbolizing is uh, the friction between two twigs, which would, or twigs or, or branches, I suppose, which would create a fire. And then well, what your natural thought then would be, what is the rune of, of uh, creating or, or fire? And it would be torch or kenaz. And, you know, there's nothing more attractive to other people who are darkened in the, in the dark and cold in this time period, especially in autumn when it's becoming the dark season than an attractive fire. So I think ultimately, if you are going out there and saying you're trying to start a tribe or you're trying to reignite our ancestral roots, what you need to look at are the two runes or the formula between the two of now these towards Kenaz and creating that fire for other people to uh, see and then understanding that they will want to make their own from that as well. Absolutely. And that actually really uh, aptly speaks to a lot of the old traditions that I've read about sort of all of the uh, village fires would be extinguished, be rekindled from the, the central one, uh, from the main hearth fire um, that would be ritually lit so that people are sort of drawing from that uh, that same flame. Exactly, yeah. And that that's essentially what you would view as uh, gods. They might have been living people. Some people view that as blasphemous. I don't really care. It doesn't really matter to me. Like, it doesn't matter if they are real or not, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they live on any plane other than within yourself. At the end of the day, do you want to get things done or do you not? Right. Is really the ultimate question. So if you want to debate with people online about uh, polytheism or anything like that, go for it. But I think you have uh, the good work to accomplish. And if you're not doing that, then clearly the gods don't exist for you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's absolutely yeah that's absolutely something that i wish um would be incorporated into more of uh, the conversations around this because it mm -hmm. really does not matter in that way and that's to me uh that is one of the things that is supposed to at least set us apart from uh fundamental fundamentalist christian christians or what have you is like yeah there's so many people who are so wrapped up in trying to prove the literal existence of their god and for what because that's not what makes us moved by something. That's not what actually resonates in our lives. Like there's yeah, plenty of exactly. living people right now who don't mean a damn thing to me, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't... So that's, it. that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a teacher I once had who talks about the difference between reality and literality. And so no, like we're not actually shooting flames out of our hands when we do protective work. We're not literally, mm -hmm. you know, like, but the point is he used to say that it was like, uh, love isn't something that actually punches you in the face physically, but it's a, it's a state of being or it's a mindset or what have you. So mm -hmm. that's, I think more, uh, something that makes sense in terms of experiential knowledge. And I guess what you would call gnosis. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, it's it's a diff it's an interesting topic because I both actually believe in the gods and I also don't care to prove <laughs> them as literal at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a few different ways you can view it and like, you know, depending on if you're a, a lateral thinker or a linear thinker, um you can you can strive for the answer or you can look across many planes for a few answers at a time and uh that's really up to you, right? But um, a good example of that is uh, one colleague of mine, Zach Kasman, has actually been working uh, on one of his first articles for our website about exactly about this topic of the wild hunt and how he believes it could even be an ancestral memory so powerful that it's still seen throughout places like England and Germany and uh, most of Western Europe today because essentially what you might have there is... Uh, the people who lived in Western Germany or that sort of uh, area in general of Scandinavia before we had horseback riders come in or what would be the Indo-Europeans, um, you'd have uh, essentially what our mythologies describe as the Vanir tribe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Vanir are also contested, like, is it even a tribe or is it uh, just another word for God? But if we're going by the theory that they were their own tribe of gods, which would be Freya, Frey, and yours, all of those. Um, essentially, what you have there is a sort of fear of men coming on horseback. So that wouldn't have been a thing for the people settled there before the Bronze Age, if that makes sense. And so he's working closely with me and a few other people to 
uh, get some better sources and get a few more things in the works there before we post it. Because obviously we don't want to be completely 1800s and have no, no, uh, you know, sources other than myth, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. we like to, we like to toe the line a, l a little bit, like, you know, w pretending we're not insane would be a sin. So, <laughs> okay. yeah. so sane, but also able to cite sources at the same time or insane That's it. with sources. Yeah. Depending on what we're talking about, right? So that's why I say it's a little, it's light uh, history, uh, heavy on the myth, uh, sometimes, and then vice versa for other articles, I think. Okay, I mean, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit more about that website and a few other things that might be cooking on it, idea-wise? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the first articles you might see on there will be about um, a type of yoga. And now yoga is often grasped solely by where that word comes from and that would be the eastern traditions and they're fantastic for keeping your peace of mind but we also disagree on many facts of sitting under a fig tree for meditation is not what our ancestors would have been doing essentially what we have been trying to concoct is a set of um, yogic stances that involve weaponry such as the spear or such as the sword things like that so um you know, War Yoga is the title we've been working with. Uh, we really try and drive home a new archetype of a sword dancing, chivalric, merry man sort of thing. And so that seems keeping to be your entire vibe on your face. Yeah, that's absolutely it. Um, like, uh, yeah, the, the Western Knight or the Occidental Kshatriya is a, is a great page for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it really, that's, that's one of the main things we're starting as a foundational uh, jump point from the website. Uh, but probably moving more into things like uh, my new uh, workout regimen, which will incorporate uh, forest walks as long, along with esoteric stuff, along with like a basic program for people who want to kind of dip their toes into working out and see if they want to do that sort of thing. And that's going to be called the Woodwosian spirit. And for anyone who doesn't know what a Woodwose is, that would be something like, like a tree beard or maybe even a Tom Bombadil. You guys can debate about which one, but I, I, to be honest, it doesn't really matter. You know, just an aspect of uh, going and being a forest dweller is uh, foundational for most myth as well as foundational for most of me and my friend group. It's where most of us met. Uh, the other guy who was in Unbowed, he lived on the opposite end of the forest. So I lived here, he was here, and we'd meet in the middle of the woods. And we'd oh, most of the time... Yeah, and we'd mostly skip school and go and cook eggs and bacon in the in the forest and watch the sunrise and hope we'd see a troll you know <laughs> that That's was the most but, hobbit-tastic yeah could have possibly exactly <laughs> well again it, even even hobbits could be seen as like 1800s like victorian wood woes i guess in some sort of way um they don't really know what's going on there's a, there's an innocence to them sure. but there's also a magic to them as well and so there's no shame in starting off as a hobbit, I guess, if you wanted to put it that way. <laughs> Honestly, I, I find that very relatable. Sometimes I just don't want to be bothered by the outside world. And frankly, yeah. they're quite content. So yeah. they're on to exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that would be one of the first things that uh, the site is going to be doing. Uh, you might have seen me toss around the hashtag of Halathaz, but that's the name of the website. Mm -hmm. So it'll be called Halathaz. And... Uh, yeah, we've got a few things tied up in that. So my stuff is Eyes and Forge. Then we have um, Red Wolf Luthery. That's another one that one of the other guys who's founding it, his main thing is uh, he makes, you know, uh, ancient instruments like that. Okay. And so, um, yeah. And then a lot of um, music and other stuff will, will hopefully be involved with that. So it's going to be sort of a record label as well, eventually as well. Yeah. That's quite rich. I'm, uh, I'm curious and just because you said you hope I'm ready for your tangents, I will go back to things here and there. Um, yeah. I'm curious how your sort of um, working out uh, interchanges with your spirituality and like what that means with each other, um, if they're related, which I think they are. That's a great question. Yeah. So um, my tribe's name is Oathbloods. And what that relates to is not only the oath, and that's an ancient word which regards, you know, a sacred bond or tie to one another or to you and something, uh, but it's also used as an anagram within me and my people. So uh, the O would be oak, A as ash, and then the TH would be thorn. So oak, ash, and thorn, uh, that ties back into an old English song by, well, written by Rudyard Kipling and sung by one of the last scops of England, Peter Bellamy. And 
what we've used there as is we've used it as more or less an alchemical formula for creating your the perfect you or trying to connect with higher you in a better way and so um yeah so oak would be strength for sure physical strength ash is what we see is uh gaining insight uh so you could see that as wisdom and thorn would be what we'd say is spirituality and really connecting with the thunderer and all of that if that makes sense so all three of those are extremely important to me uh they're really important to uh the other guys and so when people ask uh, if they can join or prospect with us, we tell them we're still prospecting. Uh, we're still trying to get started ourselves. And if they want anything to do with us, what they need to do is figure out what the the title of cultured thug would mean to them, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. that's a great question, though, is uh, what, if you were to be interested, what would you look for in uh, kindred spirits, as it were? Yeah, we're trying, essentially what we're trying to do is um, create a, a hero cult. And so really trying to picture what you see as um, the best possible you. One of the things I posted earlier today was, you know, what's the you you would see when you die who would bully you on your way to the afterlife? Like, what does that guy look like? How can you become more like him with every breath you're taking in this life? Um in a word, I, I think the best way to put it would be um, we try and tell them to learn something completely new, try and show us what their, their best qualities would be, work out, what are you reading right now? All of this sort of thing is would be the questions we ask them. And typically that turns people off right away. Oh, yeah, definitely. People hate homework. Yeah, yeah the, people hate homework, one. And two, I think there's uh, so many different connections I can make to the the stylized i'm in a group with uh you know i'm in a band and that's something i've just been used to since i was 12 years old so mm -hmm. i i know i can i can smell a rat if that makes sense so when someone's saying they want to join yeah. and i can see they only they're paper thin it's yeah. it becomes pretty apparent quite early on uh always has and always will be pretty easy for me i think that's a skill i gained really early on in life and I'm thankful for that. So although I've not ever really seen much past beer money for most of my musical projects, uh, I've gained a lot of wisdom in that strength, in that uh, way, I suppose. That's strong enough. That's something. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm rich with the wisdom of knowing when to, I can see a pose. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, that's something that I, uh, I'm always torn on how much I want to talk about that. And uh, I know that this is not the exact topic tonight, but it's my damn page, so I'll throw in my own shit. Um, yeah. There's this class, there's this cliche with fandoms. I, a certain amount of people watching this will probably know this, where it's always like, I'll do anything for you. I'll do whatever you want. And it's like, what if I told you to read a book? What if I told you to work out? What if I told you to clean your fucking room? Suddenly, <laughs> you won't do anything for me, will you? Because yeah, the point I can is, see you should be doing something for you. And like, when people get frustrated, because I take more professional clients than I do personal submissives, it's because what I look for is, I don't think it's that crazy, but it's along similar lines. It's like, you should already have a decent grasp of who you are, what you're looking for, you should have done a certain amount of research by yourself. And that's not me being gatekeepy or unwilling to talk about things. It's just I have this general feeling, and I, I feel this way both with BDSM and with witchcraft and with paganism, is when you look for a mentor, it should not be a substitute for Google. We have so much at our fingertips, you know, mm -hmm. the questions that you should be asking Google, go do that first. Do everything that you can by yourself before you reach out and try and uh, take your path in that direction. Or rather, Connecting with community is one thing, like everyone should be doing that no matter what point in your path you are. There's nothing like, I'm not going to be mean to new people who show up to when we used to do rituals and stuff like that publicly. But right. if you are going to say, oh, why can't I be your personal sub or why won't you mentor me or uh, why can't I join your coven? Well, try earning it. Like, that's the point. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Again, it goes back to that sort of formula of Apollo and Dionysian behaviors. And so what most people like about the idea of tribes or anything to do with like um, like a sexual exploit like that, they would, 
I guess you would say it's the lust. So that would be Dionysian, right? And so there's a daringness to it. There's a, a shadow side. There's a, I'm not sure what's going to come next. And so when you tell them that there's also an Apollonian court martial sort of style and uh, rigorous training that you need involved with something like that to practice and properly worship, whether it be your tribe, whether it be yourself, another person, uh, it, it suddenly becomes unattractive to them because all they were ever truly worried about is their own personal image, their own personal quick gain. And that's nothing that interests me. And that's where I think I find myself um, allied more with uh, the Amish people around Southern Ontario more than most of the quick fix uh, North American waste men. <laughs> I think that's also perfectly great. I mean, people talk a lot about like um, the sort of like tourism in paganism and the whole like new age, like flash in the pan type people right now. And I'm honestly not that worried about it because no. that's not something new. There has always no, been something. people who are there for themselves or they're, you know, out of ego or whatever it is. Like that's, like, yeah, there's a certain annoying, unique flavor to the New Age shit right now, which I could rant about forever, and I already have, so I won't do that right now. We've um, talked about that a bit, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure people are tired of it, actually. But, uh, <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I think mm -hmm. in my first thing that I did with Biker Witch, it was literally just me talking about uh, crystal moon water pagans for, like, 20 minutes straight. <laughs> Yeah, I remember I was watching that after uh, okay. you guys did it. Yeah. He doesn't stop me. Like, he doesn't cut me off. So I just like, <laughs> don't want to talk about it. Oh, he's, he's great for a conversation. I've only met him the one time, but really nice guy. Uh, hope I'll have some more conversations with him in the, in the future. But yeah. Uh, I had such, I won't even talk about my idea. I had an idea for the most epic uh, cross national Samhain ritual where I was going to try and get together all the pagans that I like off of Instagram <laughs> and trying to get everyone together for like a, an actual sound thing because we have a blue moon. It's a full blue moon, which- Yeah, it's very exciting. Personally, I don't know about you. No, I am very pumped for that. It's gonna be great. We're actually, like most of us are doing a sober thing right now. So, and we're gonna break that and the 31st of October and during that. So okay. we gotta have a big fire out in the woods. So that'll be fun. Okay. Is so that, until then, uh, yeah, until then, I'm on the bubbly train. I was <laughs> just been say, drinking. Are you drinking bang or like what are you drinking? It's just sparkling water. That's what I've got going. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's become quite the, 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 the meme between us all. We're just all drinking bubbly right now. <laughs> really funny. Yeah. Like, is that like a spiritual <laughs> offering, a personal like? I, I, I don't know what God would want that, but they can, by all means, if they have the same sense of humor as us, then yeah, I guess so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's actually something else that um, one of my best friends that I do a lot of magic with um, will talk about is that she's, and this is a description, not an insult. She has autism and okay. she has the least filter of anyone I know. And she's also one of the most gifted witches that I know. And she will just start spout, like she, I don't know another way of saying she's super meany during ritual. Like she, <laughs> like it sounds like she's shit posting, but I'm just like, this is people relate to the gods with the language that is familiar to them. So yeah. arbitrarily <laughs> reading in Latin, you know, like I, if that has special meaning for you, cool. Like I'm all for like using Gaelic when it's appropriate. But honestly, I kind of like seeing people get uh, a little more raw with it and draw from things that they're personally familiar with. Yeah, me too. Um, I think that's a, that's a big aspect of what me and my group of people have been doing for years is, uh, you know, if you're a new guy, you're completely welcome to come, but you're not going to understand most of the things said because we just almost have our own language at this point. Yeah. It's uh, entirely schizophrenic. It's entirely, like, funny, probably, to yeah. most people coming into that. But... Uh, yeah, it's, it's just an aspect of male demonism, which is a word tossed around quite a lot lately, um, which meaning, you know, it's it's us against them all sort of thing, if that makes sense. And uh, it's like a uh, just another aspect of what I would assume to be um, like something you'd uh, go to a laboratory to create, you know what I mean? So like 
it's just all experiments with a lot of the rituals that we pro we do and a lot of the time it's uh figuring out what works and what doesn't totally yeah i'm just still i love male demonism that's fucking hilarious <laughs> yeah. i forget who coined that term i'm gonna look it up but yeah i've definitely heard it before i'm like wait i'm gonna turn my light off real quick yeah, no worries Anyway, I'll find it later. I was, I was going to do a, um, a bit of a write-up about that sort of thing as well. So, but yeah. Yeah, in our group, like I was saying, it's like a lot, a lot of the time, most people don't understand what we're saying. And yeah. that's kind of how we like it. And that's... Good. That means, yeah, it's just... Um, out. It's fermenting. It's just a, a group of people who've been fermenting for a long time and creating our own sort of thing and whether that be involving psychedelics whether that be involving just our you know unabashed brains with no other human around that we don't think gets us we can we can just go full force with us you know that's the brain so, cell. that's what we call it. that's what my uh little tribe calls it um yeah it's you just gotta sink or swim like there's you gotta adapt or just die there's no you gotta just figure it out i feel like yeah absolutely yeah, I'm also curious since you uh, you've mentioned the hero cult aspect a few times, and it's something you post about quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. For one, what does that uh, sort of mean in your words? And for two, do you have any favorite heroes across history, or myth, or both? Um, yeah, without sounding completely uh, full of myself, I guess my favorite hero would be the one I see in myself, and the one I wish to become day in day out, and the one I strive to create with every waking breath. Um, that, of course, is based on a mimetic relation towards myth and other cultures that I've been reading about since I was young. So um, the best one and the quickest one that comes to mind is the one that I've got tattooed on my arm, which is Sigurd slaying the dragon. Uh, so the dragon slayer is always a great archetype that's stuck in my head for a long time. Uh, you know, of, of course, because it's cool to a, a teenager, but of course you can look deeper into that. Like what is a dragon? And even in that myth, Fafnir was not always a dragon. He was a giant, which you could perceive just as, as well as being a human or a Lord of some sort. And what does he do? He sits on his gold and he hoards it to the point where he becomes something completely shapeless and something completely without a conscience and very lizard like and lizards, snakes and what have you, if described in the tradition of Joseph Campbell would be, uh, deep in the subconscious well or the collective subconscious of humans uh, no matter what culture you're in it, it tells you evil and it indicates there's a, a lack of emotional thought going on there and you know that's still something extremely prominent today Definitely. yeah yeah there's a comment uh, originally a dwarf yeah there's there's that one too and so what have you whatever it is that you know that it's going from something more akin to a human, something we can kind of relate to towards a dragon, which is completely inhuman, but in the same sense is extremely human. It, it kind of uh, denotes to our shadow side, if you're going back to Carl Jung's way of thinking towards that sort of thing. And so uh, the dragon slayer, whether it be slaying the dragons out in the world, mm -hmm. whatever those are to you, uh, I, you know, there's plenty of debate to what that could be, I suppose. But uh, more importantly, I think if you're going to ask who your favorite hero is, I think the answer for everyone should be themselves or the one that they're looking at in the mirror or so whatever you're looking at, if it's Spider-Man or, or Superman, whoever it is, you should probably try and understand what aspects of you you want to become more like them in, I think. And there's only one way to do that, and that is through slaying dragons and gaining your fame in that sense and you know even glancing beyond that you can look at myths like uh more intern in more inside of england you can look at small village myths some such as something like the lambden worm i'm not sure if you're familiar with that one but that one actually uh that's a, a close myth to what i would consider important to my favorite hero which would be um it's a crusader that's about to go on his uh, holy crusade and he's sitting by, I believe it's a lake, but it's been a while since I've read it. So I'll have to get back to you on that. And he sees a small um, leech of sorts and he doesn't really know what it is. And he throws it into the lake, 
kind of doesn't really care what it is, comes back and years later it's destroying his village, it's ta- tearing down the towns, and it's in fact a giant black dragon at this point, or a lindworm, I think it is, and that's essentially an old English tradition of a dragon without wings, lindworm, so landworm, essentially. And, you know, so he kills it then, but at what cost? He's lost a lot of relatives, he's lost, you know, hallmarks of his youth, there's so much that has been caused in the destruction of this thing that he could have killed years ago when it was small. And that's, you know, you can see the the correlation there between the human brain and the outside world, which you could also then therefore take back to Holy Grail myths saying, what is the Holy Grail? It's, you know, it serves Arthur and the land. That's That could be you. The hero Arthur is you, or for me anyway. So again, answering your question, Arthur would be a great hero that I denote to my favorites um, because he is England and England is he, that sort of thing. And I think the outside world is very much your own perception. And so we are gods in that way. And we are also heroes in that way. And so creating your best hero is hero culture to me. And that's what's Halithazian. And so recreating that is our, our main goal. It's very practical. I like that the focus is very pragmatic and not just um, something lofty and uh, separated. Right. Yeah. It should be a humbling experience. It should be most days not understanding that you eat, you might ever see a light, you know? that's I think that's a huge part of it. And shadow work is extremely important to that. Oh, there's, a, there's a ton of things that I could totally, uh, that I would love to open up from that, but I do want to try and finish before uh, Instagram is yeah. off. So no worries. Like seven minutes, but um, <laughs> that's a lot for, pe- for uh, people to process, I think. Yeah, uh, so sorry. Hopefully, this has been interesting. Yeah a little bit um the dragon is just something that i'm so i'm interested in on a few different levels because there's the um you know sort of union joseph campbell perspective but i've also heard from a british tradcraft perspective that the dragon um because it has to do with more like the base uh, urges and impulses supposedly that the dragon actually represents the soul as opposed to the spirit which is allegedly you know like more mental as it were and then we're sort of like in between that. So it's for us to mediate almost. And Mm -hmm. that's interesting because like the whole dragon slayer thing, that is something also big in the Christian mythology. Like a lot of the saints are seen slaying dragons. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, that can be interpreted different ways because for them that could be killing the more base spirit of something like heathenry um, or sin or whatever, like that can be taken different ways. But, right. Uh, I think I think it's ultimately uh, a fight of good and evil, which resonates in all humans. And so yeah. despite what puppet you put on the hand of good and evil, um, the you know, most people, depending on the time period, you're, you're going to get a lot of people into those stories. You know, if we go back to Joseph Campbell, the hero cycle, you know, the most grossing film these days typically is Star Wars. That's the exact same thing. Sure. Um, it, it, it never really matters what uh you what the archetypes are i think it mostly matters on two people if it's good triumphing over evil and so as long as you use those tools correctly and you know how to weave a story in that sort of uh with sort of way which is like you know the storytellers of wales or the one who knows is essentially how that would translate uh you're probably going to uh turn a few heads at least and get people understanding what you're trying to say and feeling good about that so yeah the dragon being evil to christianity and what is evil it would be heathenry i guess and you know but going back in time before that it's more a basic uh don't be greedy yeah. and i think i've always aligned more to that one but you know i get the premise of all of them and so i can't despite my teenage years i can't be angry at christianity completely there is of course a great deal that it has done good for us as well so yeah I mean, yeah, and it would be, I think that's fair. I mean, it would be a little um, overly edgy for its own sake to not see Jesus as another sacred king. Because if we see Mm -hmm. everything as mythology, um, you know, that's what he is. And I think that's, that's what's so interesting about the Arthur legends is I feel like those are where the sort of um, pagan spirit in the lore comes together with uh, sort of the messages of Christianity. Absolutely, yeah. And another way that that is woven into it, even for uh, 
a pre predominantly uh, Christian audience, you still have paganism there, still guiding the way. the 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 high The hand that guides Arthur, the the master that trains him, is Merlin. And again, as I said before, if you look at the the French root of Merlin, it would be Blackbird. So again, re relating to something that most people shy away from, um, as well as at the same time, sort of as a pronged fork approach, it would also be relating towards pagan roots of England. And so pagan roots of the land guiding the way for the once and future king is an extremely powerful message towards a giant group of people who I'm sure even in those times would have had some pagan stories or essences going on in their lives. There's some things you just cannot get rid of. Right. Case in point being the maypole that's essentially dancing around the phallus of Frey. Right. Uh, those who dance around it being the sperm impregnating from the land it's the same thing as the lingam in vedic cultures the stone phallus in the ground that they offer things towards uh these are things that you know obviously to christian minds would be horrible and you don't want to go near but they can't get rid of them there's some things there's some stones you can't unearth i think that's very apt so i guess um can you remind everyone where they can find you and your various projects while we wrap things up i guess yeah, absolutely. So for my main band, which I, we're currently working on our next record, uh, it would be Unbowed, Unbowed official Instagram or Unbowed Bandcamp. Uh, you can find my fitness apparel and uh, various other works on eisenforgedfitness.com or again, Eisenforged Fitness Instagram. Uh, if you want to look more into the works I do with uh, Nui Clothing and with... Uh, artists such as Chelsea Wolf, my Ironworks page would be Blood of Brocker. And that's Blood of Brocker Ironworks at um, in, on Instagram or on Etsy. Uh, yeah, and then for the more crusty black metal people out there, I'm also working on another Soldier Tower release. So that will be on Bandcamp or on my main page, which is AO4 Eyes and Tours. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So people can find you in your various ventures. Awesome. Well, that's it. Thank you for your time. I really, really appreciated your insight. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. I will try to find YouTube sooner rather than later, but we'll see because I have German homework. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Take care.